Hi, I'm Bill Lundgren from G-Day. In this demonstration, I'm going to illustrate how you can, from a high-level abstract implementation in code, uh, have a compiler, the IDEA compiler shown here, uh, create the complexity of an application that's running on first an Intel quad-core processor and then secondly on an 8-core TI DSP. First thing I'm going to do is to uh, start the application. I have a command line prepared here uh, that will load um, the um, application itself and then various auxiliary files. So in this uh, application at the top level, I happen to choose to use a block diagram to illustrate the uh, processing. Notice that I'm uh, selected the stop button because I the the application automatically started running, um, and now um, and so I have these functions at the top level which are block diagrams and it shows the structure of the application. I could have e as easily built this using a textual input, uh, but chose uh, for clarity purposes to use a block diagram. Uh, I, rather than to go into details of this application, which are covered in other uh, lectures and videos, I'm going to uh, focus on the parallelization aspects of this application. So what I'll do is I'll open up the cross-correlation PAR, the parallel version of it, and in order to better see the code, instead of using the GDAY uh, development environment editor, I'm actually going to... Um, bring it up as uh, text code. Uh, so this is a textual version. We call it an IDEA function. This is the IDEA language. And the cross-core power is effectively calling the cross-correlation. What we're doing is we're taking a matrix of data, notice the two dimensions on the input, and we're converting that matrix, um, I'm sorry, we're converting the stream of input data I'm sorry, we're converting that matrix of input data into what we call a family of submatrices. These are non-overlapping family, and uh, the size was R here, the size is R1, it'll be approximately the size of R divided by N prox, that's the size of our range variable. Then we're going to take the submatrix and we're going to stream the rows as vectors, and because our cross-correlation, our match filter is a vector, uh, a process is a vector of data. We're going to pass each one of the family members into that function. And then we're going to uh, collect the results and turn them back in, uh, the vectors back into a submatrix and then the submatrices back into a full matrix. So this is just the strategy for parallelization. Notice that the cross correlation function has not changed. We're using the same cross correlation function we'd use in uh, any other application. Uh, we've added the parallelization strategy above that, if you will. So now the question is, how do we make this run on a parallel processor? Um, what, uh, what we've done is uh, I automatically loaded uh, implementation settings. So if I bring up the implementation control, we can see uh, what was done in order to uh, uh, direct the compiler to build a parallel version of this to run on this Intel multi-core. So the first thing is we had it, um, we toggled the run on target, uh, so this means it's going to run on the target ra rather than run in the development environment. Uh, the second thing we did is we set the uh, partition table uh, to actually partition the uh, functionality amongst the processors. Notice these are our family indices, so we have four of each one of these functions. Uh, they're named based on the output. Uh, we can look inside them and see that they are the cross-correlation function. Now what we did is we numbered the partitions from P0 through P3, and what we did is we took uh, and use an equation when we had the family because the dollar sign one corresponds to the 0, 1, 2, 3 family index and so that gave us P0 through P3. So this is how we partition the functionality for distribution and with each of the functions uh, goes the memory associated with that function and it's the output memory that goes with it 
um, uh, in keeping with streaming uh, languages and data flow languages. So the next step was to partition the um, uh, to map the partitions onto processors. And so we had processors numbered 100 through 103, and we can see those in the configuration viewer. And so this is actually showing each of those processors, and we can actually um, uh, pr see the processor information. And so this tells the details of the hardware model that's being used. And we can also uh, look at the MAP software, and this tells us the full set of functions that are being executed on that particular processor. You notice there's a fair number on processor 100, which has P0, but if we look at uh, 102, uh, then we see that there's a fewer number, not too many fewer, because our cross-correlation function is actually quite complex. But in any case, there's lots of detail that's given uh, to the developer for purposes of analyzing the application, viewing how the implementation was done by the compiler. Okay, so the next thing um, that we'll do is to look at the transfer table. And so the compiler now figured out all the processors um, that have to transfer data from their memory into um, memory on another processor. Now this is a shared memory architecture and these are all common transfer methods so no actual data is moved across a bus. Uh, this is just using the shared memory features of the multi-core processor. Um, so we have the control to do various things. Um, again there's more details in other lectures and videos but here we're doing uh, send bus or just on a single buffer. Uh, we could multi-buffer the data, but there's no reason it won't give us any better performance in this case. Um, that is, that's the uh, limit of what we've uh, had to do in order to set this up for running on the quad-core process. I will show you that the compiler has uh, created a, a, um, an executable for each uh, of the partitions and you see each of the partitions listed here and there's all sorts of controls and information that you can get out of these so for example if we look at this subschedule um, 3 uh, that's on the uh, on P1 then you can see that this is the sequence of functions that are going to be executed and this is the memory plan. One of the strengths of G-Day of course is it automatically implements a highly efficient memory plan. Okay, so without um, uh, describing that in more depth, uh, let's look at the trace table. And when I bring the trace table up here you see that it's collecting a bunch of, uh, of events. I'm going to go down here and zoom in on one of these and I will look at what's going on on the processor. Oh, we, we're missing one on P0, so I want to go down further and find one here. And so let's look at this one. So we'll zoom in on that, and what we see is that we have, uh, we have uh, uh, the events on each of the par par cores are running in parallel, so these block uh, black boxes here are actual trace events. If we use the uh, right mouse button and select on that line, we will see the particular function that's running, in this case, a VXF inverse FFT a function that's running, and we see other statistics about that function. If we, uh, one of the things we'll, we note is that this particular P0 uh, subschedule is actually running slower. If we look at the details of what's going on in there, uh, the details are that it's uh, running the FFTs and the inverse FFTs and the vector multiplies and so on. Um, we can do the same thing for another processor and you can see that the processing is more compacted here. This is generally the case that we have s uh, some task running on this uh, uh, core. This also has a, a Windows 7 uh, OS running as well, and so this is uh, this core is is actually busy. Uh, if we optimize the uh, the services that are being used, this will be very tight. 
So the one that we really want to pay attention to is the kind of performance that we're getting here, and we can see that this is running. And um, if we if we ignore this slow processor, it's running in about uh, 350 microseconds. Um, so there we have it. We have it running. Uh, I, again, you can see more details of this trace table in other lectures or videos. What I want to show you now is uh, what's involved in uh, making the same application run on uh, a TI DSP. So um, what I'm going to do is because we, because I build the TI DSP over um, uh, using the Windows, this is actually a, a command prompt uh, from Windows, and I'm running GDA on Windows and building the uh, application that's going to run on my TI EVM board. Um, you can, if you happen to glance at the command line, this is very similar to the command line. The difference is, is that I'm using uh, TI for my group settings, and I noticed one thing here is that currently on this system, um, the uh, the IM for implementation settings doesn't work, and I have to use the GR uh, for group settings. Uh, this is using different constants as well because I'm doing eight processors instead of four. I have eight cores on my DSP. So let me run that, and it was being difficult. It wasn't wanting me to run it, and it's only because I don't use uh, command props in Windows very often. So my application opened up on a second screen. I'll bring it back over here. And um, it's also going off and, and starting to run. Um, I'm going to let it uh, continue. This is exactly the same code. I have not touched the, the code itself, and I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. Um, this is uh, building uh, the uh, processes for each of the eight cores. Uh, it turns out that it doesn't need eight different ones. It only actually needs three different ones. So it created three different ones. Uh, there's a little bit more involved in the compilation for the, the TI DSP. So we'll let that finish. Let me, ahead of that, uh, tell you uh, what I'm going to do is that uh, this is going to come up and start running. And it's going to ask me for a, uh, it's going to say that it's ready to start. So it's doing a host connect, which you see right here. And what that means is that I'm now in a position where I can start um, the uh, DSP up. So I'm going to turn the power on on the EV EVM board. And this is a, a TFTP, which is um, acting as the FTP server between the EVM board and GDAY. And so now the uh, processor, the TI processor, uh, when it started, uh, downloaded the application and started it running. So I'll close that, and you can see that now the application is running. I'm going to go back to the GDA toolbar, and I'll stop the application, and then I'll bring up the trace table. Um, and let's zoom in and look at that. One thing we notice is that there is this is less variable, um, and that's actually what we would expect to see. I'm going to slide down here until I get a, a, a full uh, set where you have uh, events on P7 as well. The events are collected in a circular buffer, and so that's just because we're doing it um, on a single buffer. Okay, and so here's the application running. Um, notice that this is running uh, slower. Um, that's actually to be expected because we are uh, running with a 2.5 uh, gigahertz clock on the Intel processor, but only a 1 gigahertz clock on the TI processor, and the TI processor, of course, is more efficient. Um, the actual transfers that are occurring here are offsetting the processing on P0, so that's lagged a little bit. Um, if, we're, if we didn't have the, the, um, the uh, simulation uh, going on on P0, we would see a different trace table, but this gives us a very good indication of the processing. And, of course, here it's uh, running in one... Uh, 0.38 milliseconds. Um, so let's do the same thing that we did on 
the intel. We're going to look at the processing here. What you'll see is that the processing time is about 11 uh, microseconds for the FFTs and the inverse FFTs, and that the processing time for the uh, vector multiply, and in this case, the standard uh, TI library doesn't have an intrinsic for doing the vector multiply on the coprocessor, the SIMD coprocessor, so this is not running particularly fast. Uh, that's something that we'll work with TI on. But in any case, um, really, basically, there was very little involved in uh, porting this application between these two very different uh, types of processors. So let's look a little bit at, um, at what we had to do and I'll bring up the um, implementation control and notice that we still have it running on target. Uh, that's the same thing. The uh, partitioning um, is exactly the same. We didn't change the partitioning except for now we're running on eight cores instead of um, four cores. And then mapping the partition table, um, here we're mapping through to processors uh, one, which is a zero, which is a host, so it's actually mapping to the host that's identified over here, and then the processors um, one through seven, which are the, the other seven cores on the Intel DSP. Now, the reason why we are putting this here on this host processor, because we are not running on a development platform. This is actually a command program that's running on a TI DSP chip, and so uh, we call that a host. Uh, it's running down on the target hardware, in this case, the EVM board. Um, notice the other thing is that we set the probe size here to 40,000, and the reason we did that is so that we could collect some output data because we do have uh, probes turned on. And I, I will show you the probe table here. Um, so we have the output uh, probed. Uh, it's just the output of the VXF underscore abs box, the absolute value box. And uh, so uh, the, um, the other thing that we did here is we explicitly put this in shared L2 cache or MSS, MSM memory, as, it, uh, as TI calls it. So if we look at the trace table, then we see that we're using um, host common MSM and uh, common MSM in pointer, and again, there are more details about uh, the, the distinction between those various uh, types of processing. But I can say um, that the, uh, the ones that have host here, there's actually a transfer of data between uh, core zero and other cores in the processor. So um, effectively, very little differences. It's very quick to set those up and to run the application, to collect the trace table and analyze it. Uh, we can look at the um, schedule parameters here. Notice that we overrode the default memory and put this in shared memory, L2 shared memory. And um, so we have uh, actually very little effort. Most of the effort is in uh, selecting the run button and having the compiler build the application and then target the hardware. One last thing I'd like to show you is that in the tools, I, uh, when I declared a memory buffer on processor 7, it meant that the data, uh, probe data was being uh, collected in memory. And what I want to do is to dump the data to disk. And so, um, I selected the menu item to do that. Now, the reason why we collected in memory is because, number one, the bandwidth between the EVM board and the host processor is low, and, and number two, the TI doesn't provide a print function that allows you to write, or a write dip function that allows you to write the data on the host processor. No big deal. We have uh, uh, methods to handle every situation. To finish the demonstration, I will right-click on the output of the VXF abs uh, box. That's the one where the data was probed. Uh, we notice that there are eight tokens, so I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to use the VF1 plot, uh, which is just a vector plot function for floating-point data. Um, 
GDA actually invokes another uh, copy of the compiler and uh, builds the application on that uh, in that copy. Um, here we have it's uh, it's brought that uh, uh, display up the the vector display that I mentioned the VF1 probe, and if I step we can see that there's the data that was properly processed. We dumped it down from the TI processor, and now we've looked at all eight tokens that were collected and verified that we're getting uh, a typical uh, response from a match filter. Thank you very much for listening to this video. If you have any questions, please contact us at support at gday.com. That's support at gedae.com. Thank you very much for listening.